Hello, everyone. And welcome to Boosting Chromebook Adoption with Effective Change Management. My name is Darren Ryden. I lead the Chrome Customer Success and Partner Engineering teams in Google and EMEA. Can you remember the last time you asked a child to do something? How did you convince them to do what you wanted? How many times did they ask you why? Probably more than once, right? So we know change is hard. When we ask someone to make a change, we're asking a lot from them. Very often with IT projects, we expect people to change. We don't really think through the implications of this. You can see this nice quote from Robert Cialdini. He conducted years of research on real life situations of persuasion, and he concluded that people simply like to have a reason why. And that we will be much more successful in influencing people if we can provide them with that reason why that they understand. Today, I want to talk to you about how we can help you guide your people through a migration to Chromebooks, help them understand the reason why for themselves. We'll go through some of the theory behind this, and we'll share with you a set of new resources that we've recently created to help save you time and effort when putting together your change management plan. If you do all this correctly, there's a much larger chance of you, your project being able to deliver on its business objectives. So how can we actually help you? So there's a few things that we can do. We've broken these down into three categories. The first is best practices. So we can help you with guidance, best practice guidance from the industry and from experience we've developed from working with our other customers, access to our communities. So you can access specialists and other customers as well through our um, community and also assets that we've created for you to be able to use. Secondly, um, we're a customer as well of, of Chrome at Google, and we've been through the same process as you. So we've also got a lot of learnings that we're able to share, and we make as much of this available as we can to our customers that are going to be going on the same journey. And third things through tools and solutions from third parties. So we want to work with other third parties as well that can help um, with solutions and other tools that are going to help you on your way and help you through that process of your migration project. So I mentioned that change is hard and change management is important. I think it's really good if you can step back and think about what a project consists of and how much time and effort you should be dedicating to the types of things that you need to do as part of that project. Now, the majority of the technical work or the majority of the work, sorry, is gonna be the technical configuration and setup. This is where you have to do the integration with Google services and make sure you've got the right application environment. Now, most companies also foresee a significant element of project management. Um, but it's very often people forget about the change management. And sometimes this isn't even considered until after a successful launch. So in an ideal world, we would say the amount of change management and effort that is dedicated to managing change is about the same as the project management as well. So probably about 30% each. Um, so 60% you know, overall compared to the 40% for the technical setup. Now, it's really important to remember that for any change, any organizational, any company change, people are always going to be at the core of that change. So what you do, you need to make sure whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that your plan is going to be influencing, persuading and inspiring behavioral change in the people in your workforce. So how do people change? So let's look at a couple of examples. So I'm a, I'm a keen cyclist and I would say that cycling is embedded in everything I do. But learning to ride a bike is actually pretty hard and you need to be motivated to keep trying when you inevitably fall off during those first few attempts. So for me, when I was young, um, I think I was three, my dad always cycled home from work and leaned his bike against the wall when he got home. So I wanted to do the same thing, um, but I couldn't because my bike had stabilizers. So as crazy as this sounds, this was my personal reason for motivation, right? I wanted to be able to lean my bike against the wall and I couldn't do it. So. I was excited, I wanted to change, and I wanted to learn something new. So this was my excitement, and it was a personal reason. So the next step is I needed to get those skills. So I went through this enablement phase. So learning by trial and error, and throughout this process, I was driven on by that initial motivation. Eventually, I managed to acquire the skills, got the job done, and I was enabled, right? I was able to ride that bike. Now, over time, I was able to ride more. I was able to do more. I was able to visit family, friends, able to go to school on my bike, even start doing things I hadn't done before, like exploring areas off road and stuff like this. So this is where I was able to expand my skills and expand my capability. Now, if you fast forward a few more years, I would say that cycling has become truly embedded in everything I do, right? Um, if I need to go to town, the first thing I would do is jump on my bike. 
if I wanted to do exercise, the first thing I would do is go for a bike ride. Even friends I've met, many of them are through cycling. So this embed phase is where you can say that that transition is complete and the change is really going to stick. So it's only when you get here that you know you've actually been through that process successfully and you've succeeded. So we've defined this as four simple steps, excite, enable, expand, and embed. So that was a simple example of someone going through change because they wanted to. I made the personal decision to commit to that change and we're calling that a chosen change. Okay. But we don't have that luxury all the time. Sometimes changes are imposed upon us. So think about those two types of change. Um, we're calling this like a change architecture, right? So chosen change and an imposed change. So a good example of an imposed change. If you think about me right now, I'm working at home like many others. Um, this wasn't something I chose to do and it wasn't something I was particularly excited about. It was something that was imposed upon me totally out of the blue a couple of months back. Now, luckily for me at Google, we quickly looked at what our employee needs were and what we needed to be able to work at home. The process was quickly put into place for us to be able to order additional equipment. So we were able to get things like monitors, um, cables, audio equipment. Obviously, we were already in a good place because we all had Chromebooks, um, but there was still a conscious effort made to think about that enable phase and make sure that we had everything we needed to be able to do our job and to be productive. In parallel to this, Google team did a really good job of communicating the reasons why. So why we were working from home, how long we expected to be there, um, all the other implications, what that meant, um, and provided a lot of support. So, you know, this didn't really get me excited, to be honest, but the point is it really helped me understand why and really helped me build in and commit to that new way of working. So after a month or so, we realized that we were going to be at home for a more significant amount of time. So this is when we started to think about, well, how can we expand this ability we've got? So for example, today I'm sat here recording this session with additional equipment. I've got lights, microphones, webcams. Okay. So now I'm doing something at home that I would never have done before. That's something I would have only done in the office. So we don't really know when things are going to go back to normal either, but we're realizing that, yeah, there are also benefits in this particular change, right? Um, it's quite likely that the way we work now, some of the things I do at home are going to be embedded for the future as well. So this is a great example of a change that was imposed upon me, something that I wasn't even prepared for. Um, the effort put in behind making me understand though, made me buy into the change and actually, you know, the company's realizing benefits and also, also I am too. So just to kind of think about this again, these are you know, the differences between an imposed change and a chosen change. The process behind this is still the same. You still go through those same four phases. However, it can be slightly different, but if you focus on the process properly, they can still be very successful. So let's look at these two different options in the context of Chromebooks. So for a choice architecture of a chosen change, say a typical knowledge worker environment, so you've got a switcher, switcher option, a device catalog, and people are going to be, have to buy into that change on their own. They're going to need a lot of information in advance to understand why choosing a Chromebook is going to be the right decision for them. That means you need to put a lot of effort into getting that message across. What's the communication strategy going to be? How are you going to make sure you get the right message? How are you going to deliver that reason why to all of your audience to get them to buy in? It's critical to get that excite phase in a chosen sort of change architecture, because if people don't make that choice to opt in, then you know, you, you've got nothing, right? You, you've got nowhere. So you really need to make sure that you put a lot of effort into that and then also maintain that excitement throughout the process to make sure that the change sticks and that they don't opt out of that process. So, you know, the bigger the why is and the commitment up front, the more chance there is of them going through that process on their own, but it's still very easy for them to opt out. So, you know, continue that, that communication throughout the process. So most people will recall rebellious teenage years, right? And, you know, remember being told to do something makes you want to do the exact opposite, right? So a lot of the time when people are on the receiving end of an imposed change, they become defensive. So in many frontline scenarios, Chromebooks are deployed to everyone in this one single initiative, right? However, it's still important to win over those users and explain to them, get them excited, right? It may be that 
when you look at this process, you know, everyone is going to get one, right? So you kind of could just start at the enable phase by rolling out these new devices. But if you don't get everyone excited as well, you don't provide that reason why, then people aren't going to put the effort in and you're not going to be as successful. So even if you've got an imposed change, it's really important to remember you've still got to get people to buy in. You've still got to tell them the reason why. You've still got to put that communication out there. It just might be that you don't put so much effort up front and you continue that effort throughout the process and you go through, continue it through the enable and the expand phase. Make sure you keep reinforcing the reasons why. So at Google, we've built a Chromebook adoption framework. Now this is based upon the process of change for individuals, but what we've done is modify it so that it can be applied to organizations or larger groups of people. So it's got the same four steps, excite, enable, expand, and embed. And we've defined the activities that ideally would happen within each of those stages. And then this will help you and help guide you through that process. So excite is all about driving excitement across the organization. So making sure you're engaging executive stakeholders, building a sponsorship model, ensuring that there's clear communications, um, setting a clear vision as well is really important at this stage. And then you make sure the rest of the communication can align with that vision. During the enablement phase, a lot of the technical work will be done and you know, your project is ready to launch. The first few batches of users will receive their Chrome devices. All of the communication here needs to continue to reinforce that same vision that was designed and defined when you're engaging the stakeholders of that excite phase. So expand is when you're going to grow the adoption. So this is when you get more groups of users involved. You're going to roll out, you know, to additional um, parts of the organization, and you're going to develop a network of champions to help support that community through the process. And then once you know, you've got widespread adoption, people are using these Chromebooks. It's going to be important to remember to embed this, these new skills and this way of working. This is also a really good time to start measuring and promoting um, the success of the project, right? So review the progress, promote the success stories that you've got and continue to reinforce that message. So we've talked about some of the important factors for the adoption framework. Let's start looking at the key points your change management plan should include in order to make sure that you're addressing the needs of the people that will be going through the experience of switching to Chrome. So the most important, we've talked about this already, make sure everyone understands why they're moving to a Chromebook. The second one, make sure the communications are targeted for individuals. This is all about personal commitment. So you need to make sure that people are going to relate to that messaging and the communication they receive. So they're understanding why they're wanting to opt in and what their personal motivation is. And then don't forget, you know, you need to make sure we've got appropriate training, continuous training as well. Once they've got these devices to make sure, you know, the likelihood of regression and opting out once they've started using the Chromebook is minimized. So now it's time to kind of put this together and think about some of the decisions you need to make to define your adoption journey. So what level of choice are you going to give, right? Will users choose their own devices? Will it be an imposed change? Will you have multiple Chromebook models to choose from? What criteria are you going to use to identify and segment employees? Traditional approaches would be to look at the organizational structure, but actually there are other, you know, data-based approaches. The reality is you may find people that do the same job, but work in a different way. And this can have an influence on what type of tools work for them best. So for example, you may have someone in an accounting um, department that uses simple spreadsheets to analyze data and their colleague that they sit next to doing exactly the same role, role may use complex scripts to manipulate the data. So their migration to Chrome and their suitability may need to be slightly different. So how are you going to get employees to make that personal commitment? You need to give them adequate information to make their decisions. How are you going to do that? And then think about, you know, that effective communication. You're going to have to build a step-by-step -step plan, an enablement journey that you're going to need to put in place to deliver the knowledge and information that your employees are going to need to be successful. Think about all those touch points you're going to have, how you're going to plan them, how you're going to measure success in advance. You can also then track that progress over time. So I've talked a little bit about the theory, but what I really want to do and what I'm sure most people will want to get their hands on is the good content that we've been creating for you all. So we've created this Chromebook employee adoption kit. Um, this includes all of the stuff you need to start building out your adoption plan. So we've got guidance on defining the adoption journey, how we've been talking today. We've got awareness assets that you can use um, to help drive, drive awareness within your organization and start creating that buzz and getting people excited. We've got onboarding resources that you can give to people when they're starting to get their device. 
We've got tools such as a Chromebook simulator that help show people how to use the devices as well. We've also got guidance on establishing champion networks. Um, some other templates as well used for like um, employee feedback surveys and also tips on how you can measure adoption and um, keep KPIs for success. Look at some of these in a little bit more detail. So generating awareness. So this is where, you know, you really need to have some nice, colorful assets that you can get out there, um, help promote, you know, your new project and Chromebooks. So what we've done is we've created a number of assets that you can either print out as posters um, or flyers, um, but also use electronically. So you can put these on your internet pages. Um, you've got email templates, uh, banners, other digital assets, and all of these align with the standard marketing messages that Google uses for Chrome. So it will resonate completely with all the same similar materials that your employees are likely to hear in the press from Google standard advertising as well. So this will help amplify your message as well. When it comes to helping users get going, um, you know, day one, when they get their new devices, we've got a number of assets you can use here as well, right? So we've got a getting started guide. So this is literally, what do I do when I get my device? I pick it up. How do I turn it on? What do I do next? You can either print this out or actually you could pin it to the shelf on the device. So as soon as they log in, um, it's one of the first things they see and it gives them a great starting point. So that, you know, right from that initial minute of turning the device on, they've got a good starting point and they're going to be successful. And then also I mentioned the Chromebook simulator. So this again is a nice way where for someone who kind of knows what they want to do, but they're not quite sure how to do it. It's a good way to look up and get a simple animated demo. Um, so for example, you know, finding keyboard shortcuts, setting the backgrounds, so things like that, that people tend to want to do when they start using device. So we've also got a tips and tricks library. So this is a document, um, but the idea is in here, we've got tens of specific tips and tricks and they vary in complexity, but the idea is you can utilize these as a campaign that you can send out to people, for example, via email, once they've got their device to keep reinforcing the message and help reinforce the learning. So you can choose how you use these and how and when you use them. Um, but the idea being that you can start off with simple ones and then you can increase the complexity as people become you know, more experienced with their products. So as I was saying, so when you get into the expand phase, you would still use tips and tricks as well and start making them more complex, but also you're likely to start utilizing champions a little bit more. So to help you manage, recruit those champions across your organization, help manage them, get them involved. We've also got a few templates here that you'll be able to utilize. Again, consistent with all the same branding. And then when you move on to embed, it's time to kind of think about how are you going to be capturing all of that feedback and making sure you're going in the right direction. So we've got a number of um, templates here that help you, you know, capture success metrics, um, or help you just get through that process, give you a bit of a head start when you're building this out yourselves. So at the start of the presentation, I mentioned there was a few different things we could do to help. The first one, um, so far, we've only been talking about the first one, right? So you know, um, best practices. Um, it's worth talking a little bit about the lessons that we've got from Google as well. So, you know, we've learned a lot. We're a customer of Chrome as well. We've been through the same process as most of you will go through as well. So there's a couple of key things I want to highlight that we've learned ourselves. So first one is to provide Chromebooks to new starters by default. Believe it or not, we didn't even, we didn't even do this ourselves to start with. Um, we only introduced this a little bit later, um, but this is a great way if you have new starters coming into an organization, they may or may not be familiar with Chromebooks. If you give them a choice, they may not really know what they need. So they just go with what's familiar. What we do now is we always default everyone to Chrome unless there's a good reason why not. And this is much easier than trying to convert someone later. Also incentives work, right? So incentivize users to, to switch, um, you know, create a switcher program that helps get people to move across. So at Google, like many other companies, we've got a particular refresh program for our hardware. What we did is enable people to have an out of bound or out of cycle um, sort of upgrade to Chrome if they wanted to, if they were willing to switch and also gave them the option to move back if they didn't like it. So this was a really good way of incentivizing people by allowing them to get a hold of a new shiny device without having to wait for their sort of cycle to finish. Uh, we've also got a, a grab and go solution. This is a great way for People that are thinking about Chrome want to learn more to get their hands on it. So you can just go 24 seven to one of these racks in all of our offices and, and borrow a device. 
um, either if you just want to try one out or if you have a problem with your existing device or you've left it at home. So this is a great way to, to get people experience without having to make them commit first. Um, and then of course, you know, the reason why, right? So make sure we've got enough information out there, providing enough resources that people can read it and understand the value and why they want to use Chrome. A couple of things that we'd recommend you don't do. So one is similar to we've talked about before, but don't just put Chromebooks on a catalog and expect people to use them. People aren't going to make the decision to go and inflict change on themselves unless they've got a good reason why. And it's going to be much easier to take the do nothing approach and stick with what you know. So you know, really critical to make sure you're thinking about something like that. You can't just put a technical project in place, put Chromebooks on a catalog and be done. You really need to think about how you're going to manage that change and that transition as well. In addition to, you know, those points we just mentioned, um, there were a couple of uh, videos last year from Next Sessions that are really worth looking at as well. So one of those um, is about the internal deployment and how we scaled Chromebooks at Google. And the other session is from some of our leading customers as well. So these are well worth a look. And then the last point I mentioned was, you know, we work closely with our partners to develop tools and solutions that help you. So there's a great paper from Forrester on rethinking segmentation um, for a cloud world. This is really worth a, worth a look and it, it talks about and goes into more detail on how you can use data to think about the way people work rather than kind of like what their role is and really rethink about how you're going to segment your entire user base. Uh, we've also got tools from companies like Lakeside and Softwatch, and these help you, you know, capture data and quantify application usage across your employee base and determine suitability for migrations to Chrome as well. And then finally, I'd also recommend looking at this new white paper on change management best practices. This has recently been created through a partnership with Deloitte Consulting. It gives another perspective on workforce adoption journeys with Chrome Enterprise. And finally, I just want to leave you with this link. So this is where you can go to get all of the great content we've talked about today. You can watch all of the videos, download the reports and download the employee adoption toolkit. So that's it from me. Um, thanks very much for listening today. And I hope you found that really useful.